What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is going to be the complete life, so far, of Chewie's evil brother from another mother, Black Chrysanthemum. The Wookiee that would fight everyone from Chewie to Obi-Wan, and of course countless Trandoshan lizard folk along the way. But first, I want to thank this video's sponsor, NordVPN. I'm sure you've heard about VPNs. They're the only real way to keep your privacy on the internet. By using the latest encryption and antivirus protection, combined with sending your data through one of their more than 5,000 servers worldwide, nearly 2,000 of which are in the United States. This is the best way to keep your information secure, but it also has a ton of fun everyday uses as well, and can even save you a lot of money. Your streaming services will restrict what you can see based on deals made with different regions. So by changing your server location, for example, to the UK or Japan, you can watch shows or movies that are not available in other countries. Same idea for online shopping. What's great about NordVPN is that it works seamlessly on your computer or on your phone, meaning you can get this encryption and freedom wherever you find yourself, especially important on public Wi-Fi. And NordVPN continuously wins awards for being the fastest VPN available. This is an obvious choice. With the holiday season deal still in effect, you can use the link down below, nordvpn.com slash metanerds, for 73% off a two-year plan, plus one month free, along with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So sign up today with that link below, and stay safe and secure with a trusted, time-proven VPN. But let's get back to the video. It is unknown when he was born, but Black was likely around 200 years old, the age of Chewbacca, and not the 400-plus years reached by the Elders. But we do know that, like most Wookiees, he was born on Kashyyyk, their homeworld. In adulthood, he would get himself exiled, which for these strong clan and familial people was a rare and deeply somber event. Wookiee disputes were handled in a public square, where they would make their argument and produce a series of intimidating stomps and deep roars. This balance of debate mixed with physical posturing would end up being resolved via the reaction of the audience that gathered. Not a very exact or fair method of deliberation, as the crowds could be fickle, biased, or more impressed with the physical display. And so when an accuser saw that they were losing, their last bet was to push this into a real fistfight. Weapons were never used, and even this turning into a fight was frowned upon and shunned, though when it did happen, their thousands of years of strict tradition did try to keep the fighting honorable never to permanently hurt the opponent, yielding as soon as you delivered some decisive blows, and absolutely under no circumstances would you use your claws. The handful of times in Wookiee history that this was done, the individual was labeled a Mad Claw and exiled from all Wookiee civilization. If they were to act like a wild animal, they would be sent out into the forest to dwell with their kind, no longer a part of the Wookiee families or clans. Sometimes these wild claws were even deemed too dangerous to be left alive, and would be put to death by their clan leaders. But at least in Black Chrysanthemum's case, he would be allowed to leave Kashyyyk, where we get only the cryptic description that he would go on to further disgrace his people. This is mentioned by Obi-Wan in a fight that we'll see in a bit, but keep in mind that this period of disgrace could have been for decades, and likely knew of him from some list of dangerous characters kept by the Jedi Order. And of course, Wookiees can live for several hundred years. Sometime before 10 BBY, Black was trying to make a name for himself in the fight pits. He knew that the Zonti brothers operated one of the best gladiator teams in the business, and that they used slavers to capture their fighters. Black would hunt down and brutally dismember four different slaver groups before he finally ran into a team working for the Zontis. These slavers were an all Trandoshan team, keeping up their time-honored tradition of traveling to Kashyyyk to hunt down Wookiees. After making their way through the thick, dark jungles one night, they came upon a Wookiee that they thought was sleeping, but after a stun bolt, they approached and found that the target was unconscious and tied up. Black had captured one of his own people, cut them with his mad claws to slowly bleed out, and bound him to act as bait for these lizard slavers, one of whom realized it was a trap a split second too late, and out of the pitch black of the Kashyyyk treetops came a blinding red bolt that killed one of the Trandoshans in an instant. The rest scrambled to return suppressing fire, and even the cold-blooded contractors are horrified at what kind of Wookiee would use his own as bait. And in the panic, he raises his blaster to shoot to kill, going against his auntie brother's orders, knowing that this would be his only hope to make it out alive. This time, no bolt, but only a fleeting flash of black fur as the slaver was crushed to death, followed by their leader being grabbed and thrown into a tree. The Trandoshan understood the Shriwook language, and quickly provides the answer Black was hoping for, that they did work for the Zonti, and we hear of this story because the slaver related this to a team of reporters tracking down the galaxy's most feared Wookiee, and he says that he was taken alive, confused by Black's intentions. When he says they only knew of two other crews that were killed, not four, Gersantin laughed like it was the funniest thing he ever heard, showing a twisted and mysterious aspect to this Wookiee. 
Later, they would arrive at the Zonti Bros HQ, and these humans were happy to see the slavers whole, which included Atolls, Herglik, Gamorian, and Dewutin. But when he turns to the Wookiee, he asks, why isn't it in chains? The Trandoshan tried to explain that it was because Black volunteered, but the gladiator entrepreneurs knew that a giant, angry Wookiee could not be trusted on equal footing. He admired Black's ambition, but shot him with a stun bolt and had him quickly placed in stun cuff binders. When the Wookiee awoke, a Zonti bro approached saying that he was happy to mentor the man, but that lesson won was that the Wookiee wore the chains. The Zonti saw gladiators as investments, using their expertise and capital to put the latest haul through a series of training methods including extreme weather conditions marching across ice worlds, surviving complex and deadly obstacle courses, and sicking them on others in massive group brawls to the death. Working their way up to fighting monsters like a Sarlacc, which took the Tals into a thousand-year digestion, and a bull rancor that ate the Gamorian brother. Followed by a shift to a foe that was minuscule, but numbered in the thousands. Tiny death drones that devoured the Herglick. All this investment was highly strategic on the part of their plan to pull off the biggest payday in the fight pits. And after some one-on-one -on -one combat with their final surviving slaves, they agreed that the enormous Wookiee and Dewuntin had great chassis for ultra-heavy enhancements, seeing them as organic weapon platforms and nothing else. But those fighters never lasted long, so they would keep them natural, but try and sneak in some illegal enhancements. They take the slaves to underground surgeons that had trained with Silo, a cyberneticist that often worked with Vader and the Emperor himself. These surgeons are impressed by these specimens, and one of them was even upset that they would be lopping off parts of these majestic beasts. But his partner says not to worry, they were only adding things. Small, non-moving parts that did not go against any regulations, but which might go undetected for a while, and give the brothers an unfair, lucrative, and predictable advantage in the pits. Implanting plates under Chrysanthemum's skin, adding solid metal hands, and scaffolding an exoskeleton over his already powerful and nearly indestructible Wookiee bones. The last thing he would hear before going under was the glib remark that it was good luck that they had two specimen, since this operation only had a 50% chance of success. Luckily though, they would both survive, and to see which one was the ultimate fighter, there was one final test before the brothers would take their new product to market. And in a quick fight, the Wookiee was the last slave standing. In his debut fight in the pits, Black would be adorned in Wookiee ceremonial armor, along with a pair of vibroblades. With the dramatic flare of flames that erupted to mark the start of this bout, he would hear that the crowd was unenthused, bored at the sight of another Wookiee, commenting that it was very five years ago, with the surge of Wookiee slaves that spread out from Kashyyyk since its imperial oppression of this decade. And we see how the Zonti bros had already known what the people wanted, as viewers were hoping to see a Dewutin in action, that species that had been modified but defeated by Black previously. Black's opponents were a trio of fighters, and in these opening seconds he throws his blades to the ground and leaps straight onto the Trandoshan, using his Durasteel hands to dissolve the lizard's head into the pit floor. One worked up the nerve to rush the Wookiee, only to have Black throw the third enemy into his blade, before smashing through the blade with his hand to stare into the defeated eyes of the Hook species. He would then be thrown in the fire, before Black walked over to the Nikto, kicked him in the groin, and grabbed him up to ask if he spoke Shrewook. The Nikto did, and in what must have been a very high-pitched and pain-filled voice, yelled out for all the viewers to hear, Hail Black Chrysanthemum, undefeated, unbowed before snapping his neck with a loud crack that filled the silence before the roars of cheers. And we see that the Zondi brothers' final lesson to the Wookiee was to understand the effects of showmanship. By the year 10 BBY, Black appears to have won his freedom and was a heavyweight champion, entering a semi-retirement from the pits to take on his new challenge of the life of bounty hunting. And that path inevitably brings one into the court of Jabba the Hutt. Some mysterious desert dweller had been stopping Jabba's enforcers from collecting his water tax from moisture farmers. Black was willing to hunt this person down for an exorbitant fee, and Jabba wanted to see this Wookiee's skills firsthand. He decided to sick his guards on him to see just how quick and deadly this hunter could move. And within a few seconds, the eight Gamorreans squealed and snorted their last. And over the smoking corpses, the protocol droid explained that Jabba was satisfied, and would pay half now and half after Black caught the mysterious hermit. If he caught him alive, he would get a bonus, but taking his head would also suffice. Black took with him some lackeys to show him where the attack had taken place, which was nearby the Lars family homestead. Without even speaking to the others, Black sneaks into the residence and waits in ambush. Uncle Owen was trying to patch things up with Luke, who had been saved by old Ben during Jabba's attack, but Owen somewhat blamed Ben for all this commotion, fearing the Jedi's pull into violence by wanting to be a hero. 
but walking in with a basket full of parts from Tashi Station, calling out in hopes to Luke, nobody was responding, and out of nowhere, a massive paw closed around his mouth to silence him. When Luke does get home, he rushes around and looks for his foster parents, finding Aunt Beru hiding with her rifle at the ready. She explains that the fur-covered monster took Owen, and tells Luke to just hide while she tries to get help from the other farmers. High up on a canyon ledge, Chrysanthemum is using a stun weapon to torture the human, and threatening to push him to his death. Owen is utterly confused and asks what he wants, but hears the voice of old Ben sternly declaring that the Wookiee isn't asking anything, but just wanted him to scream. Obi-Wan knew that the hunter could tell this meek farmer was not the man responsible for crushing droids with massive stones, or slaying highly skilled killers. The robed hermit was nearly three feet shorter, and hundreds of pounds lighter than him, but Black saw confidence in the hermit's eyes, a hermit that knew of his dark past with his own Wookiee people. The hooded human then spoke in some weird magician's cadence trying to trick him, but a swift smack with the electro weapon sent Obi-Wan flying into the air. Kenobi was worried that by using his saber, this story might make its way back to the Empire. But as he deliberates, the massive Wookiee's teeth rip into his bicep. Then Black lifted the human by its scrawny throat before hurling him into the ground. The hunter aimed a net gun to try and collect that bonus from Jabba. Kenobi was pinned, and then Black felt a nudge on his back, turning to find the farmer was not as cowardly as he seemed. This man had served his purpose, and he no longer needed this bait, so he just threw him over the edge. Kenobi knew there was now no other option than to call on the Force. First to send a shower of small rocks and dirt to blind the Wookiee, call on his saber to slash himself free, and then give the hunter a push into the rocks before running over to save Uncle Owen. The farmer was barely holding on, but Black had recovered and was a split second away from crushing the Jedi with a boulder, before the human flipped through the air to gain the high ground and delivered a slice through the stone and across Black's face burning and slashing through his skin, and nearly taking his eye. Kenobi scrambles to help Owen, but the pit fight champion is quick on recovery, and again bashes him across the back with a stun weapon. The human calls on the invisible force to try and blind him again, followed by a cut through the weapon to destroy it. But Chrysanthemum delivers a hard punch to his jaw that spun Kenobi, and Owen falls helplessly into the canyon. Luckily, the force was strong with Luke, and the boy was all too eager to use his T-16 Skyhopper to save the day soaring by just in time to intercept his uncle. Kenobi was stunned and relieved, but the Wookiee was singularly focused on destroying this bounty, though now Kenobi had nothing more to hide, and he used his lightsaber to send the bowcaster's bolts right back into him, hitting Black in the arm and again blinding him. While Obi-Wan pleads for him to surrender, the Wookiee instead decides to risk it by leaping off the ledge. Kenobi says he searched for days but could find no trace of the attacker. Black was forced to flee in defeat, and he was paid half up front, and so he rushes off world knowing that Jabba would not tolerate this failure, and feel like Black may have scammed him, so he knew it would be some time before he could be welcomed back to the slug Sandy Kingdom, and had to depend on the good word of Jabba's favorite hunter, Boba Fett. In Zero BBY, the Empire was scrambling to crush the rebellion that had just done the unthinkable, and destroyed the battle station that the Emperor had been planning for more than 20 years. Vader traveled to Jabba's palace to personally demand the Crime Lord to turn his power towards hunting down the leaders of the Rebellion, if the Slug wanted to be allowed to be left in control. A day later, Bobo would hire Black to come with him to help with his assignment for the Emperor's Enforcer. Vader tells them that they need to track down an X-Wing pilot that knew Obi-Wan Kenobi and who used the Millennium Falcon. Bobo was well acquainted with the Falcon and its pilot, so Bobo would hunt them down, while Black was tasked with hunting down the secret ally to the Emperor. Vader wanted him to bring in this ally alive, and Boba warns that he can trust Black, but the Mark may come back with some missing limbs. It wasn't long before the Wookiee captured his prey, or more accurately, before the agent detected him on his way to his base, and Black was forced to take him in prematurely. But Vader was not concerned, and very appreciative of Black's work, going on to use his torture droid Triple Zero to get out all the information he wanted. A torture session that revealed the base's location, and a large-scale organ harvesting program. And after extracting everything, this man, Dr. Silo, died at the droid's hands. It's unclear if Black Chrysanthemum realized this, but Silo was the one that trained the doctors that did all the surgical enhancements on him during his ownership under the brothers. Later that year, he would be summoned to a shady cantina on Son Tool, along with famed hunters Bosk, IG-90, and Bebox. The tiny hunter told the others that the Wookiee had gotten nostalgic, and the droid was confused at how he had got an entry, only to learn that Black simply strangled a contestant to take his place. In the back of this small cantina, they find a tiny pit, and Bosk remembers his time supplying other pits with a steady stream of furballs. 
and how Black shook up the market when all heard stories of the unstoppable, crazed Wookiee that actually volunteered for it all. After he beat his opponent to death, Black is all smiles and in a great mood, even in the presence of this lizard. And their patron steps forward, Vader's ally, Dr. Aphra, who says that she brought them all together to pull off a heist on an Imperial ship, moving the confiscated riches of the crime syndicate, the Soul Tool Pride. An old Arquidens light cruiser had a hole full of credits and was on the very outskirts of the Outer Rim. With Aphra's inside info, she knew just where to strike, and while the rest of the hunters were infiltrating the ship, Black was using his vessel, a modified Azatuk anti-slaver gunship, to hook a cable to an asteroid and whip it into the cruiser. This worked a little too well, and the credits were streaming out at an alarming rate. The idea was to have the astromech generate a powerful field to grab them, but several million were lost. The hunters were livid, but Aphra was trying to save face and looked like she was splitting up the hole evenly. As they leave with their boxes full of credits, Black turns to yell that she better not be crossing them, and Bosk rushes in to make sure she understood his point. But after they all left, Black took his gunship to a nearby moon to meet up with Aphra. With all the other hunters gone, he growls in glee, and she admits that she was surprised with his acting skills. Showmanship really was an important trait, and during the mission, Black had actually used his ship to activate a massive collector to make sure that they didn't miss a credit without the other hunters knowing this was the secret plan all along. As he collects his true haul, Aphra confirms that she will still be helping him search for those that carved him up all those years ago. After this, he would assist Fett in his mission to capture the rebel leadership. And over Vrogas Vas, he would smash into the Millennium Falcon to force it into an emergency landing. As he rushed the ship, he was met by another Wookiee, the now perhaps more infamous in this post-Death Star 1 destruction era, the rebel Chewbacca. They grapple and trade headbutts, but the augmented steel-plated heavyweight champ gets the upper hand and smashed Chewie against the Falcon. And as Han raised his blaster, Black slung the co-pilot into the nerf herder. And with the hundreds of pounds of fur pinning him down, Chrysanthemum rushed over to pick up the smuggler's iconic DL-44 and stared into the human's helpless eyes with his blaster and his massive paws. Chewie had a fight with Triple Zero less than an hour before, and the droid hit him with an injection of a Mandalorian Xenotox. It took Herculean effort just to stay conscious, but when R2 was able to deliver a drug to recover and stimulate him, the Rebel Rug springs alert and delivers a devastating strike to Black's jaw that knocks him down to his knees, and continued to double-handed bludgeon him into the ground with such force that the rocks were exploding up around him. Chewie was in a righteous rage and jumped on top of the exiled brother and stomped him even further. But Chrysanthemum calls on his training to regain his strength and exploit an opening, and in his style, use some unfair advantages, producing a brass knuckles assisted uppercut to continue to beat Chewie unconscious, before grabbing Han by the neck, only for the human to escape, by all things, to a protocol droid. He went to punch 3PO, but he hits him right in the energy source, sending a jolt that knocked him unconscious. Though note that he does not have the metal hands anymore. He may have still had the augmented plating underneath his skin, but at least the plating over his hands was removed. We don't see where he's getting these treatments, but with things both like the removal of the metal hand, and like we'll see later how his scars get healed, it's reasonable to assume that he's putting some of his money earned towards repairing his body. In the following weeks, Dr. Aphra was captured by rebel agents, and Vader did not want to lose her expertise, and especially didn't want her secrets to fall into the wrong hands. He posted a bounty on her that was so large it attracted most of the other top hunters, including Dangar, Zuckus, and Highsinger, and Vader reveals that he was okay with her being brought in dead. But Vader's networks eventually allowed him to track her down on his own, tasking his droids to bring her in, aided by a small squad of repurposed commando droids, but all in Black's ship. The Wookiee having grown accustomed to working alongside these droids and Dark Lord. As soon as they touch down on a remote Outer Rim world, the droids immediately get to blasting as they work their way towards the cantina that Aphra had been spotted in. Shots start flying through the window, and Triple Zero explains that his new orders were to kill her, and anyone she might have revealed the info to. This was the greatest part of the murder-loving robot's job, but Aphra was able to see that she could be brought in alive, and the droid had to comply when she surrendered. Black was protecting the landing zone, and he confirms that he was not interested in betraying Vader takes her to Vader's new flagship, the Executor, but shortly after landing, Vader's rival Silo, or rather the latest clone incarnation of this master cyberneticist, who was trying to kill the Dark Lord and become the right hand of the Emperor. The ship was in total chaos, and Aphra saw this as a way to prove her loyalty, and Chrysanthemum was blasting away with her, explaining he was only keeping the human alive because she owed him credits. 
While Vader was fighting Silo, Aphra made her way to the Emperor, and hoped to expose Vader's plotting behind the scenes. But when Palpatine summoned his apprentice, praised the Lord for being so successful at carving out a small empire within the Empire, showing the resourcefulness and secrecy needed to be a powerful Sith. Aphra was defeated, and Palpatine left them to settle this dispute. Vader walked her to an airlock, and she pled for a quick and easy death, but the cyborg shot her off into space without another word. She cried, worried of a horrible end, but Black and the boys came through with the contingency plan. There was worry this might be how things went, and Black was on standby to rescue her from her space grave. With this, she hoped to be out from under Vader's rule with this very convincing faking of her death, Vader feeling like he personally delivered it. This motley crew of elite killing droids, hacker and fallen Vader affiliate, and exiled Wookiee would work together for months, including missions like the Auction of Rur, where Aphra sold off a corrupted AI version of an ancient Jedi named Rur, which was trapped in a sort of crystal computer. The auction attracted a wretched hive of scum and villainy, including the Zonti brothers. When Black set eyes on them and their pathetic crew, he rushed them against Alpha's protests, but she quickly orders BT to fire a pair of stun cables into the Wookiee, zapping him unconscious and putting an embarrassing and abrupt end to a moment Black had been looking forward to for years. While Black was rushed off to a medical ward, the Zonti bros explained that they hoped to enter a partnership with Aphra, and she was well aware that they were still the most renowned pit fight managers in the game and they said they hoped to put this crystal with the consciousness of an ancient Jedi into a cyborg body, using its unrivaled mystical ability to retain consciousness across time and beat bodily destruction, making a fighter that would retain all of its skills learn in the pit, even when seemingly killed. She considers it, but leaves them to check on the Wookiee. When he springs awake, he grabs her by the throat, and she acknowledges Black's twisted interpretation of the Wookiee life debt concept. Black said he wanted to capture the Zonti in order to force them into a pit fight career. Just as they gave him a life as a champion, he felt he needed to give them that life as well. When the auction concluded, the cyborg Jedi crystal broke free and turned this elegant evening into a bloodbath. Blood supplied from dozens of species from every corner of the galaxy. The criminals all scrambled for their ships, but Black was singularly focused, finding Aphra through all the confusion and forcing her to open up the armory. The cyborg was rampaging through the space station known as the Sorka Retreat, and eventually Aphra was able to make it to the hangar bay containing the Zonti Bros ships, while Vader and a contingent of stormtroopers had arrived in response to rumors of this ancient Jedi relic. Aphra explained that the clock was ticking. It would be one of these former Jedi turned cyborgs that would burst in at any minute, and that she could help them escape, but just then Black came in firing with his enormous ion weapon, stunning the brothers, and switching it to kill for their latest warrior. He would pick up his once masters and detain them in their own ship, fleeing the whole chaotic scene to leave the doctor behind. From here, Chrysanthemum would take his captives to a remote outer rim fight pit, and when they awoke, stripped of their fine linens and in nothing but a lowly gladiator's rags, they stumbled out into the hot sun to see their new master with stun baton in hand, ready to repay his life debt by giving them the life they gave him, beating these two into deadly killers. After he finally achieved his decade-long goal, it's unclear if the brothers died, earned their own freedom, or stayed on as the property of Black Chrysanthemum, the new pit fight manager. Months would pass, and he would be reunited with Aphra as she ran right into the jaws of a pet caber worm. He was happy to see her, and she explains that Black is just keeping her alive to make sure that she gets his payment, but the Wookiee genuinely seems to be enjoying this unlikely alliance. When they fight their way back to the ship, he explains that these stormtroopers were not sent by Vader, but by the Minister of Propaganda, Patina Marmas Vor. Black was one of several hunters that took the bounty, but he promised he didn't want the Doc to die. And after evading a squadron of ties, they make the jump to hyperspace and rendezvous with the only people they knew would take her in, the Rebel Alliance. This served a larger purpose of Aphra exposing a darker side of the rebellion to her lover Tolvan, an imp turncoat. She tried to show her that her new friends were going to use a prototype weapon to fire a kind of miniature Death Star sniper weapon, a beam that could be fired on Coruscant from beyond the core, which could pass through all the shielding over the Imperial Palace, killing the Emperor in the last place he would expect, but also killing several thousand civilians. While she explained this, Black was in a spacesuit sneaking around the exterior of the Rebel capital ship, bursting through to try and capture the data card. Though he was taken down and held at knife point by the once elite Imperial agent, Aphra uses her history with Tolvan to let her escape. And with the data, Black scoops up the dock and jetpacks out to space to rendezvous with her ally on the ship. 
Aphra takes them to a nearby Imperial base, which contacted her old master Vader, who orders them all to be executed. Only for the very woman that placed the hit on Aphra to show up, the minister ordering that these captives be taken to the Emperor directly. On the third moon of Coruscant, Black accompanies them while she explains her larger plan against the Empire. And when the Wookiee gets impatient, he raises a blaster and finally gets some credits for all this work, being sent off-world while the minister continued her plotting. Later this same year, the Empire would strike back during the Battle of Hoth, scrambling the rebellion across the galaxy and forcing them from then on out to not operate from a world or a moon, but to always stay on the move in the Rebel Flotilla HQ. Aphra and Black continued their work friendship during this time, carrying out several smaller bounties, which would often see him using his pro-fighting background like when he beat down two Gigarans. Or when Triple Zero put a symbiote parasite into him that drove him into a killing rage, the likes of which would have gone down in the Wookiee Legends. At this point, Aphra had been working more with the Rebels, and during this attack by the force-wielding queen of Katahatan, even Han had to begrudgingly admit that he enjoyed sicking the crazed, parasite-infused evil Chewie on the enemy. After the smoke cleared, they were able to get the symbiote out of him, and eventually destroyed the queen and set her entire compound ablaze, hoping to stop the spread of her plague. These rebels would prove victorious, but it also removed the leaders of the largest stabilizing forces in the galaxy. Palpatine, Vader, and even Jabba were all dead. So everything from the government to the bounty hunting profession was in chaos. A chaos that would reign for the next five years under the weak New Republic and feuding crime lords. In this time, Black Crescented would thrive, grow richer, and come into the employ of Jabba's cousins, a pair of brother and sister known as the Twins. He knew that his one-time partner, Boba Fett, had taken over Jabba's throne, but he did not have any love for the human. He was always in it for the credits and the love of combat. When the twins arrived on Tatooine with the dramatic flair expected of a proper hut leader, Black was at their side ready to fight the new daimyo, even if the human acted unfazed and made a comment at the Wookiee's hatred for his lizard rivals. You can bring as many gladiators as you wish, but these are not the death pits of Durr and I am not a sleeping Trandoshan guard. Sometime later, Black would hope to execute his bounty, sneaking into the ancient Boomar monk monastery that was home to the daimyo. While Boba was recovering in a bacta tank, the door to the chamber would be ripped open, healing liquid pouring out as Fett was jolted out of his dream and into the arms of one of the most terrifying killers in the galaxy for at least the past 30 years, one of the few with the reputation that rivaled his own. He would beat the human down with a pair of electro knuckles before being stabbed twice with a Gadurfi stick, though the towering Wookiee was unfazed and he rushed to grab Fett up and crush the life out of him. Several bones started snapping, and with just seconds to spare, a team of Fett's newly recruited street thugs came rushing in and opened up with a flurry of attacks from different weapons. Just like the pits, he used their weapons and numbers against them, seeing a lane to break through and tackle the Gamorrean guards. Tumbling into the throne room, he would beat one and bite the other before the gang caught up to him and Fennec Shan seized the perfect opportunity to hit the trap door. But the Wookiee's reactions were quick, and Black held on, only to have a throwing knife from Shan cause his grip to finally fail. Moments later, Fett would get a surprising visitor. The twins had traveled all the way out to the palace to call for a truce and offer a unique gift, a rancor to restore his trap, and Boba had Black brought out to be given over as well. But the Hutt said to just sell him back into the gladiator fights. Boba had the power to send him back, after all these years, to that same slave status, where he'd fight under some new manager like the Zanti. But in his graces, Daimyo, the old ally, one of the few bounty hunters with more experience and expertise than Black, Boba gives him professional advice to avoid working for the Huts. Take it from an ex-bounty hunter. Don't work for skug holes. Black Chrysanthemum was astonished at this kindness and stroke of good luck. Many had failed to kill Boba Fett, but very few lived to talk about it. Black took this grace and ran off into the sands of Tatooine, likely to pick himself up after this failed mission with a couple rounds in the pits, fighting for himself on his own terms, before he figured out where the next bounty would lead him. So at least for now, that's the complete life of Black Chrysanthemum, the exile Wookiee, heavyweight champ, and feared bounty hunter. If you made it this far, the best way to help me out is to hit that like button, leave a comment, and share this video with someone who might like it. Be sure to check out the links in the description, where we have affiliate links with amazing discounts on Star Wars metal print art, and free audiobooks from Audible. You can also find our Patreon and PayPal, and special shout out to all our supporters over on Patreon. For just $1, you can get your name on this list, but special shout out to our $25 tier supporters, Bill Payne, Brandon Robinson, and Oscar Jones. But most important of all, Remember, 
Let the Wookiee win, even if you know he's cheating with top-of-the-line augmentations. And the Force will be with you. Always.